So a few weeks ago, Amazon Prime recommended a movie uh, called Demon Resurrection. And I watched it and uh, really enjoyed it. I was kind of surprised that I hadn't seen it before. So doing some research on the movie, I tracked down the director and uh, sent him a message on Facebook. Told him that I enjoyed it and uh, invited him on the show to talk about it. And uh, of course, he, you know, he accepted it. So uh, enjoy this week's episode where I sat down and uh, have a talk with uh, William Hopkins about his movie, Demon Resurrection. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. The unburied dead are coming back to life, seeking human victims. All right, so I'm here talking with writer and director William Hopkins. Hi, Carrie. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem. So, um, I Demon Resurrection was rec recommended to me from Amazon Prime. Ah. And I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. And I'm glad I did because I absolutely loved this movie. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So, um, when did you know that you wanted to make film? Well, I, I guess my story is probably similar to some of the folks that you've had on your show before. The, uh, the monster kid, uh, uh, who grows up to be a wannabe filmmaker. I remember seeing Dracula, I guess it was five years old on Creature Features. I don't know if, if Creature Features is something that means anything to you, uh, but Back in the 60s and 70s, there were local TV stations. They would run old horror movies. And at five years old, I, my parents, my father especially, insisted that I stay up late one night to see Dracula. And, of course, it impressed me enormously. And in the following weeks, Frankenstein and The Invisible Man and the whole Universal Collection. Uh, and I became obsessed with it. And I was... I sought out the original novel of Dracula and lugged that around. Uh, like uh, like a lot of people, I, <laughs> I didn't get around to actually reading it, but uh, I, eventually I did in my teens. Uh, and, I, you know, that was a time in the mid-60s and into the 70s when there were a lot of uh, franchises were just getting their start. The Twilight Zone, Star Trek, Dark Shadows. Uh, they were still making... Hammer Hammer movies. I assume you you remember the Hammer films. Yeah, I do. And uh, so that was my life growing up. And when I saw King Kong, and that impressed me enormously, and that led me to Ray Harryhausen, uh, and I became obsessed with stop motion animation and uh, special effects. So I was a very strange child. I was always the kid that was making little animation models of monsters and making monster masks and uh, made attempts to do little films with Super 8 camera. Uh, and uh, that really was my mission from a very early age. I guess it was when I saw Jaws that I realized that what I really wanted to do was to write and direct rather than to do special effects because stop motion animation it looks great on the screen, but it's a hell of a lot of trouble to do. Uh, one of the things I guess Ray Harryhausen was blessed with was an amazing amount of patience uh, because it takes a huge amount of time and so much can go wrong. And it's not really where the action is. I mean, the guys who are really telling the story are the folks that are writing the screenplays and the guys who get direct uh, to direct the film. And when I saw Jaws, I guess that was the first time I was aware of people like Alfred Hitchcock, but when I saw Jaws, that was the first time I made a special point of stopping after I got out of the theater and going to the poster and looking in the credits to see who directed this, because I was pretty sure that that was somebody who was going to be doing good stuff, you know, stuff that I wanted to see. And during that time, also, I had been following Stanley Kubrick. I guess he was the other director that I was aware of, even as a child, because uh, at a very early age, I 
I guess it was 1968 when 2001 came out. And my parents took me to see that, and I was amazed by it. So that was sort of on a, sec a second track. I guess you could say his, uh, he was doing more serious films than the sort of monster movie stuff that I was watching on TV. Uh, but when I decided that uh, direct writing and directing was what I wanted to do, those guys, I guess, were the ones that I was paying uh, the most attention to. Okay, so my, my next question was going to be, who was your favorite director? Which director influenced you most? So would that be Spielberg and Kubrick? Well, I suppose Kubrick would have to be the one. Uh, although, to be honest, there's, you know, in the years since that time, uh, when I discovered those fellows, uh, there are a lot of other filmmakers whose work I've come to appreciate. And, uh, you know, stuff that's far away from the horror genre, people like John Cassavetes, and Billy Wilder and, you know, a whole host of other people, including, you know, uh, uh, foreign uh, film directors, uh, Kurosawa and uh, Ingmar Bergman and, and all, all Fellini and all those guys. So, you know, I tried to broaden my, uh, my education uh, after my initial interest. At that time when Jaws came out was a, an, an interesting time because you really could feel that Hollywood was changing. And it was shifting away from the way they used to tell a story like that, you know, a giant shark story would have been done by somebody like Roger Corman. Uh, and it would have been done quickly and cheaply. And it would have been, it probably would have been profitable, but it wouldn't have been uh, something as memorable as what Spielberg did. Taking the story seriously and treating it not just as something that's um, a product that's turned out quickly to make a buck, done in a way so that uh, it's, it, it, it uh, shows the uh, uh, sincerity of the filmmaker, uh, a sincere desire to make something that's worthwhile. Uh, that really, I think, was a changing point for Hollywood. You know, there were a few, a few other films as well, like The Exorcist and, uh, of course, eventually Star Wars. Uh, seeing all those films right around that time, I didn't get to see The Exorcist until later, but certainly seeing Jaws and Star Wars, I guess one year apart from each other, and then seeing the other films that followed, like Close Encounters and uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now and uh, Spielberg's E.T. and Alien. Alien was tremendously uh, uh, influential, uh, I think. It certainly was uh, to me. Uh, seeing all those films in the, in the span of what seemed like just a few years, that really intensified my desire to try to make my own movies. But it was a long time before I actually got a chance. Uh, my first success was writing a screenplay that actually sold. Um, and I startled everybody that I knew, including my parents, uh, because they didn't have much hope. <laughs> they didn't think that going into filmmaking was a practical uh, career choice. And I still remember my father and he was he died shortly after he, he never got to see the film but he i remember him standing in in the living room holding the paycheck that i had received from for that first sale of the screenplay it's a film called children of the night and it was produced by um columbia tristar uh, for their home video division and it was also one of the films that fangoria uh was involved with producing and uh my father just couldn't believe that anybody would pay that much money for a script about vampires. All right. And the first thing he did, of course, which is something he hadn't done before, he actually sat down and got out his glasses and started to read the thing to see what the hell, you know, how could this be? <laughs> uh, but uh, that first sale was a great, bo you know, uh, boost to my morale. And I thought, okay, well, now I'm set. But it was almost another 10 years before I got a chance to do anything else. Uh, the first film that I did was Sleepless Nights, another vampire thing. And that was a low-budget uh, project similar to Demon Resurrection. Um, and that was a difficult uh, production. We ran out of money, and the shoot went on for over a year. You know, we ended up doing little bits and pieces over, the, you know, every every weekend whenever the producer could raise a few a few grand and uh it was a kind of a hassle to put together because in the course of shooting it 
we lost locations that we had started shooting in, so we had to find other locations that looked like those locations. And we lost some of the actors, including our leading man. So we had to use stand-ins. And trying to take all of that and make it into you know, a presentable film was a real challenge. Uh, but after that, uh, me and Frank Silla, who was one of the producers on Sleepless Nights, we decided to go off on our own and give it another try and see if we could learn from our experience with uh, the first film. And that's what Demon Resurrection uh, grew out of. Now, was Demon Resurrection, would you consider that your passion project? Well, I guess Sleepless Nights was my passion project as well, but it didn't turn out so well. Uh, I'm actually in the process of re-editing and that. And that. It's, that's, that film is almost 20 years old, so it's kind of an odd thing to be recutting a film from that long ago. But yeah, Demon Resurrection was sort of like a summation at the time of all the ideas I had about uh, horror filmmaking, at least. Uh, it references all the low-budget horror movies that I had a, a, you know affection for. Uh, things that I'd seen as a kid, and you know, and in particular, zombie movies, which other than Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, zombie movies weren't a particular, you know, favorite genre of mine. But uh, we started thinking about doing, doing Demon Resurrection after 9 11. And I hate to invoke 9 11 uh, when talking about something as trivial as a low budget horror movie. But that event obviously had a great impact on everybody. And uh, afterwards, there was a lot of talk about how nobody would be making violent movies anymore because we had seen too much violence that day and violent movies were a thing of the past. And I found that for some strange reason, my taste for violent movies actually increased in the year, year or so after that day. And I started watching a lot of zombie movies and films like Zombie 2, the Fulci film, and Tombs of the Blind Dead, and um, the Demons 1 and 2, the uh, Lamberto Bava films, and, and a bunch of others. And I started to think it would be great to take the sort of exploitation elements that all of those films had and to try to put it into a story that was actually a satisfying, dramatically satisfying story. Um, so, so as to justify, because what you usually hear with exploitation movies, and I heard this uh, from some people about Demon, is that it's gratuitous. Uh, you know, people like to use that word, particularly, particularly if there's any nudity or sex, uh, sexual content in the film. They say, oh, it's gratuitous nudity. Well, gratuitous means unearned. I don't know what you have to do to earn the right to portray human sexuality on the screen. Mm -hmm. But um, those little things were the, those little exploitation elements, the traditional exploitation elements, having some nudity, having a, you know, some sexual content, having some violence. Uh, those were all things that we had on the list of stuff we want to include to improve the commercial reception of the film. But I also wanted to make sure that it made sense in the story, that it was justified in the story, so that we wouldn't have people saying, oh, this is just gratuitous, you know. Uh, and to actually have a zombie movie that works as a story uh, seemed to me to be a, a challenge, you know. So that, that's what I was trying to do. And, of course, making references to all my favorite horror movies and zombie movies. It's Yeah, when I, when I was watching, I definitely picked up on a lot of uh, references or just things that reminded me of other... Uh, you'd mentioned the uh, Tomb of the Blind Dead. Yeah. The yeah. your your zombies in this film kind of reminded me of the blind, you know, the the look that they had on the Blind Dead. Yeah. Um, but I also, I mean, I love the look of the of your zombies in this one. You know, like I said, it had that late seventies horror movie look. Right. Right. But now that just watching some of the behind the scenes stuff that came about because I guess the FX company that you were going to use was saying it was going to cost a lot more for what you wanted. So you ended up doing the special effects yourself. Yeah. Well, certainly the, the zombie creatures, uh, that was all, I, I sculpted the masks and cast them. And that was a whole big, long process. And uh, it was kind of like going back to my childhood because that was the sort of stuff that I was experimenting with as a kid. 
and now I actually have the resources to try to do it properly. Uh, when you do a zombie movie, of course, the first thing everybody suggests is that you know, get a bunch of people in sort of messed up clothes and you paint their face white and you have them stagger around and go, hmm. Uh, and, you know, there were plenty of movies that had done that. And I imagine that the big problem that we were going to face from a production point of view is that we would have crowds of people coming out on the first day to play zombies and then they wouldn't come back for the second day. So if we saw their faces, if they became identifiable on camera, we would have a continuity problem. So I came up with the idea of coming up with some sort of uh, makeup or mask that would be, you know, sort of like one, one size fits all. Everybody would wear the same thing and it would be explained in the story that these were witches that had been hung and, and buried uh, at, at the at that excavation site. Uh, and that way, there was a logical reason for them all looking the same, and it solved that problem. Anybody in the cast and crew could step in and play a zombie if we needed them, and we didn't have to worry about folks coming and, and then you know, doing one day and never doing another. So that was the other reason. Uh, but I like the look of it too. You know, I, I think they, you know, it's, it's, it's the one thing that really distinguishes this film from all the other zombie movies that were being made at that time. Yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely happy with the way those turned out, the way they looked, uh, you know, it really, it really fit the, the setting of the film also. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I loved too was the location. Um, the house that you had to yeah. me was like the perfect location, but again, that was like a last minute yeah, find uh, yeah. and almost almost not being able to find a location. Almost You almost had to cancel the filming process, correct? Right. Yeah. All the time we were doing the casting of the film and all the time we were doing our tests of the equipment, we were also scouting locations and going around desperately trying to find uh, some place that we could use. And the problem with something like Demon Resurrection is that the story really doesn't work if it's a street on a house with a bunch of, uh, you know, a house on a street with a bunch of other houses, it has to be an isolated place. And it has to be an old building, it can't be a modern building. It's just, you know, it doesn't look right. So finding a place that was old enough uh, that people would actually let us use, because usually if it's an old structure, it's probably valuable. And people aren't particularly interested in having a bunch of idiots come in and spray fake blood around or you know, uh, bash up the furniture. Uh, so we were fortunate. Uh, Frank Solo, the producer, he knew somebody who happened to know somebody who had a house like that. And the family that owned the house was actually living in the place while we were shooting the movie. So that presented its own challenges, but uh, it was a great find. I mean, I think that adds enormously to the film. It makes it feel like an, an actual movie rather than just you know, some little indie thing that's done in somebody's living room or, you know, yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we just, I guess it was just a, a couple of weeks before we were planning to start shooting. We finally got the okay uh, to use this property. And I guess they probably regretted it because they, like a lot of people, when they give permission to filmmakers to come in and use their property, they imagine like it's going to be three or four people with a camera and a couple of actors. And we were showing up with like, four or five production vehicles loaded with rental equipment. And, you know, we had like 13 actors and a bunch of uh, background people playing the, the uh, zombies. And we just took over the whole house. You know, it was, it was, uh, it must've been very shocking, to <laughs> shocking to them. Yeah. Uh, but the producer, uh, Frank, he took it on himself to sort of uh, stay with them and hold their hand during the process and he would sit and have a drink with them and, and keep them company uh, so that they wouldn't become too, you know, uh, hysterical about what was being done to their property. The other thing was that the bedroom that we used for Grace, uh, both the bedroom, the master bedroom and the guest bedroom, those were bedrooms that the people who were living there were actually using. That was actually the, uh, the uh, couple that owned the house, that was their bedroom. And so we had to ask them to find some other place to sleep in the house while we shot these scenes. And we put all of the scenes with the bedroom at the beginning of the schedule so we could get them all done, get out of that, those rooms. And we worked in two shifts. Uh, 
which led to like 15 hour days or more. We bring in one group of actors, work in the afternoons until sundown, and then at sundown we'd have another group of actors coming in, and we'd work through to midnight or one or two o'clock in the morning. On a couple of occasions, we went right around the clock, and we were, you know, just leaving the set when the sun was coming up, which is an exhausting thing, and it must have been exhausting for the poor folks whose house we were using as well. But um, it was probably the most exhausting and difficult thing I've done in my life, but it, it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you had like a, I guess compared to other independent or other, would you say you had a small or like a large crew that was It was pretty small. Day? Yeah, it was pretty small. It was, I shot the film and uh, Ed Wheeler, who was uh, the co-producer on the film and the, uh, one of the stunt uh, uh, directors, uh, he acted as a sort of production manager. He would be the one sort of uh, heard the actors and make sure that they were all in place when we started shooting and, yeah, I cracked the whip, and that was invaluable. Um, and Laurie Miller, who plays Kate in the movie, she was also a stunt person. Uh, and she actually was in a, a company uh, with Ed Wheeler that specialized in doing uh, fight uh, choreography and stunt work uh, for TV commercials and soap operas and stage productions. So she helped out as well on the production end, which is really remarkable because she was one of the stars of the movie. So she was playing her part. And then when, when the cameras weren't rolling, she was helping us with production stuff. Uh, and we had a uh, fellow by the name of Stephen Snow, who was sort of the uh, second unit uh, uh, cameraman, or second unit director of photography. Uh, but he ended up being sort of an all around guy. He, he was working the sound. He was doing every conceivable thing. And that was really true of everybody. Uh, but other than that group of myself and Frank and Ed and Laurie and Steve Snow, uh, five people, I guess that's a pretty big crew for a small movie, but I imagine there's some that have more than that. What I didn't want to do is have a whole bunch of people that we'd bring in that would be, you know, more trouble than, they, they were, <laughs> than they're worth. I, I had that experience with the first film because the producer on that film had the feeling that we should just sort of invite everybody that we knew, come and help us make a movie. And a lot of times there wasn't any work for those people. And they would just sort of stand around and get in the way, or they would be a drain on our resources. They would be the ones that we'd have to find, a, you know, transportation for, and they would be hanging out at the uh, craft services table, eating all the food. And sure. so, so for me, it wasn't such a bad idea to have a small crew. I suppose it probably it might have helped to have somebody who was a better uh, cinematographer than I am. Uh, but one of the things I felt strongly about was that on small production, you learn as much about every aspect of the, of filmmaking as you can so that you don't have to be, rely on other people to do the work. Because you're never on a small production, you're never going to be able to pay people enough to care as passionately about the film as you do. And I saw in my first film, we went through quite a few people who, you know, they were, I can't imagine why they got involved in the first place because we weren't offering that much money. I assume they did it for the experience, but their heart wasn't in it. And I didn't want to really be working with people whose heart wasn't in it. I felt even if I couldn't do a, a great job as the photographer, uh, it was better to have me doing it, you know, than to have somebody who uh, didn't care at all, you know. Yeah, it must it must really help out also because you're you're not going to have on a on a big Hollywood budget you're not going to have some of the actors helping out you know with lighting and all that so it must be nice to have actors that can um, when they're not in a scene help out somewhere else you oh, know yeah. on the film or on the set yes it it, it there really was on Demon uh, a feeling of uh, you know esprit de corps or camaraderie everybody was in uh, pitching in and helping out and because you know, we tried, we wanted the whole production to be done in as professional a way as possible. We wanted to respect people and give them proper credit and proper compensation. And we did pay uh, the actors pretty well for a low budget production. Uh, but one of the few advantages to doing a small film like this is that you don't have to do it exactly the way a studio production or a union production would be done. You know, it, it, it's more of a question of just 
doing what you feel is necessary to get the film made the way you want it to be made. And so it's great when actors say that they'll help out. You know, some of the actors could have said, look, I'm, I'm not going to uh, play a zombie. I'm here playing this part. But uh, just the opposite. If they saw that there was a need for an extra zombie, they would jump into the costume and be enthusiastic about it, which, you know, was, was very heartening. Uh, but they were long hours, and I'm sure there were a lot of people uh, who <laughs> they were glad when it was over. Cause, you know, yeah. 21 days uh, being with the same people uh, in an isolated place in Long Island and actually took like two hours for some of the, some of the folks in our cast and crew to get out there uh, for, to do that for 21 days, you know, that's enough. <laughs> Everybody was happy when it was finished. And, uh, you know, towards the end, we were starting to peter out. And the funny thing is that some of the scenes at the beginning of the film were actually shot, shot towards the end of the, of the shoot. And you can sort of see that uh, there isn't quite as much care <laughs> going into some of the opening scenes uh, as, you know, the later scenes. And that was because we were all trying to get the hell out of there. You know? Yeah. Now, you know, whenever the, in the movie, when all the characters first come together at the house, of mm -hmm. course, they all start, they're outside, you know, they all pull up and they're waiting for, uh, you know, the friends to get home. And when that scene, and then once they move into the house and they're all in that, the you know i guess the living room part of the house i i had the feeling i, I kept thinking i feel like i'm watching a stage play yeah and well, i met and and to me that was fine i because it made me feel like i was actually watching you know what i'm saying like i'm part of it so right. it's like the actors were they weren't acting to the camera they were acting you know to the audience right um and then so i wasn't surprised when i watched some of the behind the scenes stuff that a lot of the actors this was their first film, I guess, after coming off of just doing theater. Yeah. So was was that a, was that in like a, a I guess intentional? Well, to... I think it, it's I, I think all the people, just about everybody in the cast, they're talented actors, and I've seen them in stage productions, and I know how talented they are. I think with some of them, uh, there was there was slightly more theatrical in their delivery uh, than probably uh, they would have liked to have been if they had. You know, once they had seen the film, they probably would have wished they had toned it down a little bit. Uh, but I can't blame them for that. I think that part of it is that they're doing a film with a director they don't know who he is, right? They don't know how much they can trust him. So if he's saying, you know, bring it down a little bit, bring it down a little bit, they're thinking to themselves, well, this guy, maybe he doesn't see what I'm doing. So maybe I should bring it up a little bit. So you actually get the reverse effect. And it's not a, a intentional defiance. It's just that they, uh, they're they going by their experience, their experiences in theater. They feel they should project. And there's very little that somebody like me can do to <laughs> convince them that that's not the right way to do it. Over time, they sort of simmer down. And some of the actors, like uh, Alexis, who played uh, Grace, she was doing very small, intimate work, you know, very quiet and very real, I think, for the most part. Mm -hmm. And there was a contrast there between the stuff that was being done in the bedroom between her and Kate and the stuff that was being done in the living room with all the other actors. And it may simply be that all the other actors were in the group and it was almost like a theatrical situation. They felt like they had to project because there was like, you know, six, seven other people there. Uh, but that's a hard thing, I imagine, for uh, to get out of your system. Um, but you know, in a sense, maybe it creates a uh, a contrast that is interesting, yeah, because we do have that contrast between the way they're behaving and the way Grace and Kate are behaving. So maybe that's a good thing. Uh, if it's if it has a stagey feel beyond the uh, the performances, it probably is also because that's my other great love. I, I love plays. I love reading plays. I, I love watching plays. Uh, so I guess there's a part of me that is doing something that might be a little uh, stagey. Uh, you know, I have that in me. Uh, but it's, it has its cinematic aspects as well, I, I think. There are some setups there that I think are uh, unusual for a low-budget film in their complexity. Uh, so, you know, 
but I see what you're saying. It does have a stage play feel. Yeah. Like I said, I, I didn't like, it wasn't a negative at all. Like I really enjoyed that. Almost, it almost gave the, it almost gave it like a charm. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that, uh, with my first film, another inspiration was dark shadows. Now dark shadows. I don't know if you're familiar with the show. Yeah, I am. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it never won any awards for uh, its acting, uh, but it had a certain charm to it and it had a certain atmosphere. And what I took away from that show uh, and put to use in both of the films was that uh, when you're working on a, a production where you really can't afford to do anything, you know, you can't have car chases and explosions and so forth. Having people talk about stuff is about the, the most you can get away with. Uh, so I tended to write a lot of scenes that were very dialogue heavy. Uh, fortunately in Demon, uh, only half of the film is that way. Past the midpoint of the film, it's almost all action to the end of the film. Uh, but that's a little quirk or <laughs> defect or uh, uh, characteristic that I have as, as, a, as a writer as I tend to rely on dialogue to tell the story which may not be a good thing. I don't know. If you're doing monster movies and horror movies, it probably isn't such a good thing. Right. Yeah. So did you have, did you have investors on this film or did you just put it on a credit card like other independent directors do? On this film, uh, there was one main investor and that was, he, he was also the producer of the film, Frank Silla. He, he's the, uh, he's the guy that, that put it on his credit card. Oh, okay. And um, we probably spent more than we should have because there's sort of an optimal budget for productions of this, of this type. You know, going in, that for a standard definition shot on video movie, it's not going to be playing in movie theaters. So that's one whole market that's, you know, you can cross off the list. And the DVD market, well, that whole, the home, whole home video business went into decline shortly after we finished the resurrection. So the main places that we would have been able to sell DVDs, like Blockbuster, they, were, they weren't buying as many DVDs anymore. You know, they weren't stocking as many DVDs. And then eventually they went out of business. Um, so probably in order to uh, make a profit on the film, we should have kept it in the ten dollars or $20,000 range. We went closer to the $70,000 range. And we should have known that there was very little likelihood we were going to be able to make that back very quickly. But so you said it, you said it was shot on on video, so it yeah. wasn't. Um, what like what camera did you use? We used the Canon XL1S, which was a terrific camera. And actually, when um, they did Twenty Eight Days Later, they used the PAL version of that same camera. But the PAL version has more lines of resolution, so it it transferred to film better. Our film, I don't think, would have. Uh, transferred very well to film uh, and I don't think it would look very good on a big screen but uh, we made the decision to shoot it in, st in standard definition and in standard screen 4x3 because it was our guess that the DVD market would pretty much stay the same for a little while longer and we'd be able to get the film out and make make our money back on it that it didn't turn out that way unfortunately uh, the DVD business was pretty much, and we, we started to get, as soon as we started to shop the film around, we were getting distributed saying, we won't look at anything if it's not in high definition. And I know myself that um, in the years after the film was finished, sometimes when I would show it to people, I could see that there, as soon as they saw the shape of the picture, that it was in standard screen, they would start to lose interest. Because there, I guess there was a whole generation that, that was brought up to think, if it's not in widescreen, it's not a real movie. Right. Uh, so after a couple of years of, of struggling with it, uh, I figured out that what I needed to do was to up res it and, and uh, change the format so that it would be widescreen. And we were fortunate that we shot with a, a really good lens because the uh, camera we used for the first film had a fixed lens uh, and the image was very soft. It was a good camera, but it wasn't meant for professional filmmaking. The XL1S had you could you know interchangeable lenses. You could buy a professional lens and put it on it, and that made all the difference when we were doing the conversion to widescreen, because if you were to blow a blurry image up to you know to fill a widescreen frame, it would look awful. 
but the picture uh, the picture was sharp enough in demon so that you, it, it could withstand that enlargement uh, so after we figured that out and after we up it and, and made it uh, made it into a widescreen presentation that's when we entered into the new age fortunately right around that time Amazon was starting to offer its new video service the instant video service so we were able to get it up on that and uh, now it's doing pretty well on Prime actually yeah like I said I mean it was recommended to me just through you know Prime it you know it recommends your movies based on what you watched and I'm like I said I'm glad I watched it I, I really enjoyed it um Another another thing that I liked about it was the way that it was lit. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of reminded me of um, the the Tom Baker era of Doctor Who. Oh yeah, had that like I, I, I guess on TV shows they kind of film everything just kind of I guess you call it flat. Flat light because yeah, it's right. I guess it's easier just to hey just light the entire room. Right. right. Um, but for me that seems more practical i guess if like you know if, like in a, another horror movie if they're in a living room they only have one lamp on somewhere just to give it mood right but in real life people if they're hanging in the living room they're going to have more than one light on so it gives it that more yeah realistic feel i guess but uh, that was another thing i enjoyed about it well one thing that i was uh, afraid of was having the image be too dark because when we were shooting this uh, people were still watching movies on analog tvs and a dark video production on an old-fashioned TV really looks awful, you know. And on, a, on my first film, we briefly had a, a, a DP who owned the camera. I think that's why the producer uh, hired him as the DP. And his philosophy was you pretty much let the camera decide what the exposure should be that you, if it's supposed to be a dark room, if it's supposed to be lit by candlelight or something like that, you light it minimally, and then you shoot it just the way it is. And the result is that you get a, an image that's full of noise, and it's soft because the, sh the focus is never going to be really sharp if, if the aperture is open all the way. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can brighten it in post, but you're just brightening you know, noise. So on Demon, I said, let me overlight the set and then stop the camera down so we'll get a good sharp picture and it'll be uh, vivid. And then in post, if I want, I can darken it further. But it's also true that we were rushing to get the film made and we couldn't really do the sort of, um, you know, aesthetically appropriate lighting uh, that we might have wanted to. Uh, if you have to take an hour between each setup to play with the lights, you know, that we would never have been able to finish the film. So we went for a sort of general lighting uh, for most of the scenes. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's probably a flaw in some people's minds. Not, not everybody is necessarily a fan of the Doctor Who style of lighting. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. It, it really couldn't have been done any other way. And right. I had, think it, I think it worked out. I mean, like I said, it's I guess it's one of those like happy accidents, or you know, you had to do it this way. But yeah, it was it was for the better, right? Yeah, if we were shooting in high definition, if we were doing it today, uh, we might be tempted not to use any you know studio lights at all, uh, just use practical lights. But at the time, with the camera we were using, and you know, it just didn't seem like a risk that was worth taking. We didn't want to end up with a bunch of footage after going through all that trouble, a bunch of footage that looked like crap, you know. So. Now, one of my favorite, um, I guess, special effects scenes was the when Marcy is being pulled to the window and she gets her, no, she oh. falls through the window in the glass. Right, yes, the belly the, ripping scene. Yes. Yeah, it cuts, it cuts into her stomach. Um, that was, did, was that something, that, did you do that special effect also? Did you I do did. all the special effects? I guess I should ask it that way. Well, uh, I did the, uh, the zombies. I had assistance from uh, Ed Wheeler and, and Frank Siller in uh, sculpting different parts of the zombie. And I, I guess you, you saw uh, on the blog, you saw some pictures of us casting different parts of, of the zombie uh, costume. Uh, and I did the baby. I created the baby. And um, the gore effects were done by the makeup artist that we hired, uh, uh, her name was Ashley Benatar, and I think she was like 19, and it was her first 
film. And she came onto the movie just days before we started shooting. And she did all the beauty makeup. There was always a line <laughs> of people waiting to get into the chair and have their hair done and have their makeup done. And she also did the gore effects, the intestines and things like that. But Marcy's belly ripping scene, she added blood and stuff, uh, uh, intestines to the actor. Uh, and then six months, eight months later, in my apartment in the Bronx, I set up the whole, you know, like a little uh, facsimile of the window and dragged a, uh, a dummy, a sort of artificial Marcy, over actual pieces of glass. And that's how we got that effect. Yeah, that was one of my favorite effects yeah. in, the, in the film. It always gets a good... Every time I've seen the film with an audience, that's the scene. That and the birthing scene uh, always get a, a loud reaction from the audience. Right. And it's a very satisfying reaction because it's the sort of reaction where everybody starts with a horrible, oh, you know, and then the, it trails off into laughter. Like it, f folks are really enjoying it. So it's not really disturbing. It's just, you know, it's, it's effective. It's, it's, it's cool gore rather than just, you know, disturbing or shocking gore. Right, yeah. Which is my preference. Now, the other, I guess the other big scene besides of anything you filmed in the house would have been the, um, this, I guess we'll call it the sacrifice scene or seance scene in the woods. Right, yes. Um, how, what was that filming like? Well, we waited on that till the end of the, of the shoot. That was one of the things we did in the final days of the shoot. As a matter of fact, the scenes of Grace being tied up to the tree, that might have been the last day. I, I forget now. But anyway, uh, obviously, anytime you're doing something that involves uh, full nudity with uh, one of your actors, it has to be handled with a certain delicacy. Uh, so we shot all the stuff with the cult members uh, separately. And then when we were ready to do uh, Grace's scene, uh, everybody else got off the set. To, to the uh, consternation of Will McDonald, who was playing Toth, <laughs> I think he thought he was going to be on the set for those scenes. Right. Uh, but uh, he was way back somewhere uh, in the woods, uh, away from the scene, possibly peering through binoculars. I don't know. Right. <laughs> but the funny thing was, we when we shot that scene, one thing about Alexis was that she was a great screamer. She screamed and cried all through the movie, it seems. Uh, and when we were shooting that scene, we were within shouting distance of other houses in the area. Uh, and um, nobody called the police. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would think that somebody would call the police because we actually did have that happen at another point in the movie when we, when Barbara is attacked by the car when they're leaving, Michael and Barbara are leaving and she gets mm -hmm. attacked. And she's a pretty good screamer too. And after one of the takes, I looked up and there's two police officers coming through, through the, uh, through the uh, woods, you know, com coming towards us. And so what the hell is this? You know, turns out somebody nearby uh, called the cops and <laughs> said, there's somebody being murdered out there. Uh, but with Grace, nobody seemed to mind. Hmm. So I don't know why that is. But it was a, it was a, you know, tense. It was a tense thing. Like I say, anytime you're asking somebody to do something like that, uh, there's a certain amount of, you want to make sure it's done right. That was true of the, of the love scene as well. Uh, because you don't want people to end up looking bad on, on screen if they're going to commit to the movie mm -hmm. to that extent. You want to make sure they look good and you want to make sure that you get everything you need to make the scene work properly. Um, and I think the love scene came out very well. If we've had some compliments, some people that didn't even like the movie, <laughs> so they liked the sex scene. Right. <laughs> uh, so that's nice. And it also, you know, is one of those things that we could check off the list of exploitation things that we included for you know to make the thing commercially viable but uh, alexis was certainly a, a very dedicated performer i give her all credit for that i think she's a very good actress uh and uh, she certainly was you know completely committed to the to the part and gave it at all gave her all went way beyond the call of duty mm -hmm. yeah so, everybody all the actors uh in this film i thought done a done a pretty good job yeah 
I, I think so. I think that's probably one of the advantages of going with professional actors, even if sometimes you maybe get a slightly theatrical performance from them, is that they are professionals and so they can commit in a way that, you know, if you were just hiring friends or relatives, uh, they really wouldn't commit to the part as, as much, you know. Uh, actors know that there's a certain point where they really have to become the person and, and uh, that's something you can't get from amateurs in my experience. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm really surprised that like this, this isn't that more people haven't seen this movie that um, me too. <laughs> um, do you, what do you think? I mean, other than the, what you've already mentioned with not being able to get like a theatrical release. Um, do you think that, do you think that's made, mainly what hurt that in the DVD? Yeah, the DVD market, market. collapsing, that probably hurt. Uh, also, we had already had the experience with the first film of dealing with uh, the sort of distributors, DVD distributors that would handle a movie like this. And so we saw what could go wrong and what probably would go wrong. And the problem is that these movies don't make enough money for us to make money and the distributor to make money. And you know what the distributor is going to do is they're going to set the deal up so that they get all their money first. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened with the first mm -hmm. film. The distributor made out all right. We didn't even make back our investment on the movie. So we wa wanted to avoid that with the second film. And we started to see the same sorts of contracts being offered. And we were, you know, for a while there, we were getting, I don't know how many we got, how many offers we got from different distributors. Uh, but they were all basically the same deal they would have like a 50 or $100,000 expense cap and that money would come back to them be, before we got anything. So even if you had a 50-50 deal with them, <clears throat> they get the first 100000 Well, you know, it's probably not going to make more than 100000 <laughs> Right. <laughs> and actually the way the market changed, um, most of these distributors weren't even committing to putting out more than maybe 1,000 discs. Well, no, there's no way if you're selling a, a disc for on uh, at wholesale for like fifteen dollars, uh, you know, a, a unit. How can you possibly? How can everybody make a profit? You're, you're not producing enough of the product in order to make a profit. It's just not not possible, you know. Uh, but we were naive on the first film. We thought that distributors, when they picked up the rights to distribute the film, they would keep distributing it and they keep putting it out and printing up more discs. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it works. They had a very specific number. They knew how much money they would make if they printed up a certain number of discs. They had it all figured out in advance. And the fact that we weren't going to make a profit, that didn't concern them. And, and it shouldn't, you know. We should have been looking out for our own business and, uh, business interests. Uh, but with the second film, we didn't want to do that. We thought, if we can't get the deal we want, we'll distribute it ourselves. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's not possible to do that, you know. Right, yeah. Uh, they have the the infrastructure of distribution all sewn up. There's no way you can crack it. And even if you you make up the disc yourself and you do all the promotional material and you're ready to release it, you go to a company like Amazon or a company like Netflix and you say, would you like to buy this? And they say, we don't buy from individual filmmakers. We buy from uh, distributors. We buy from content aggregators, right? They want to buy a bunch of films. They don't want to buy one single film. So we were locked out of some of the biggest markets that remained at the time. Uh, so we realized that that wasn't a way to make money. Fortunately, streaming came along. And I guess now that's the main way that people see movies. So, uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that they that you know you got this put on you know amazon prime that, cause that, that, would, that way i could watch it um yeah and i have to it. give i have to give credit to amazon you know there's uh, many criticisms that one can make of amazon and it seems to be a very popular sport nowadays uh to criticize them but the one thing i can say for them that i can't say for apple or google uh or netflix is that they provided a platform that indie filmmakers like myself could participate in uh, you can't do that. I mean, if you go to an aggregator and, and you pay a thousand dollars, they can take your movie to Apple, you know, and get it on iTunes or whatever service they're offering now. And the same for Netflix, but there's no guarantee they're going to take it. With Amazon, 
you have a film, if it's anything that resembles a film, they'll accept it and they'll put it up there and they'll let you make money from it. Uh, not as much as I would want, <laughs> but you know, I got to give them credit for, the, for that much at least. They're giving us a platform that these other big companies could easily give us and they aren't. So my kudos to Amazon for that at least. Yes. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I really enjoyed the film when I watched it. Um, of course, I think I've watched it twice now. Oh, that's um, good. And of course, I've been telling everybody that I, people that I know would enjoy it. Uh, I've been trying to let everybody know about it to go check it out. Well, course, maybe you know, this explains why our Amazon Prime uh, streaming numbers are going up. <laughs> maybe, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, the, you're the one. You're the yeah. <laughs> It's remarkable how much effect you have. You obviously yeah. you're an influencer, right? So um, before before we get off here, um, what are you currently working on now? Well, I have a bunch of scripts, and I, I'm sorry to say that the past 15 years have gone by so fast, and uh, it certainly wasn't my plan to allow so much time to go by without having a new production. I got a bunch of things that I would like to do. Um, what I want to try to do is get this uh, revised version of my first film finished uh, and then I'll have two presentable films so if I want to raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo I can point people to things that you know I'm, I'm proud of reasonably proud of mm -hmm. and that might help me to raise funds for new productions but I got a lot of uh, you know I've been writing a script a year since I was in my 20s and obviously most of those scripts have never been made never come close to being made but if somebody's crazy enough to give me the money, you know, I got a whole bunch of stuff and it's all pretty much in the same genre, uh, you know, horror, science fiction, fantasy, monster stuff. Uh, but the goal is always for me to try to give it, uh, you know, give it a, a story that is a little more, you know, well thought out, uh, a little more satisfying than what you see with a lot of, you know, low budget horror films or even big budget horror films. So. Yeah, another another thing that um, I enjoyed about Demon was it wasn't because like nowadays a lot of the independent horrors are um, they either do a slasher in the woods or right. it's just some kind of eighties throwback where you know you didn't attempt. Of course, I guess that wasn't a thing, but you know when you made it. But that's another thing I enjoyed about it. It was you know different. Mm -hmm. yeah. It had that. It had that. You know that different. You know. Well, that's certainly feel to it. that I can say it was not accidental because I was definitely, you know, philosophically opposed to just doing what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then God knows if we did a little bit of market research before we started uh, planning Demon Resurrection, mm -hmm. just to see what other films were, were coming out, low budget horror films that were coming out on DVD. And if you, back then you could go to Blockbuster and rent a whole bunch of them. And it becomes very disheartening after a while to see this basically the same story uh, being done over and over again. And it's not really even a story. In most cases, it's just a premise. Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. just the people in the woods with a guy with a knife chasing them. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, you would have thought that we had seen enough of that from, you know, films made in the 80s. Uh, but, you know, I mean, on YouTube, sometimes I'll see 80s slasher movies I never even heard of. You know, right, yeah. Just crowds and crowds of these movies that uh, were turned out at that time. So you think now, if people have the ability to make their own movies, they would try to be a little more imaginative and do something, you know, uh, a little more fantastic, something that has uh, a more roman romantic air to it or a magical air quality to it, something with a bit more charm. Uh, but um, I guess it's it's very tempting to just get somebody in a mask and give them a knife and say, chase that chick around the woods. And <laughs> right. So um, if, if anybody wanted to, um, you know, sort of reach out to you, would you have social media? Um... Well, yeah. Uh, we're, 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 I'm, all, I'm all over social media. We have a Facebook page for demon resurrection. Um, I have a blog, William Hopkins films.com. I believe it is. I, uh, we have a, I have a Twitter account of my own. There's a Demon Resurrection Twitter account. There's a Twitter account for, for my first film. Uh, there's a Facebook page for my first film. So anybody doing a Google search on William Hopkins uh, or Demon Resurrection is going to find more than they probably want. But, uh, yeah, I'm out there. And I can send you links if you want to put it up uh, when you launch your podcast. Uh, you know, I can give you the links to add in the description. Okay, uh, but and I appreciate and I appreciate your kind words about the film, and it's really 
it's very gratifying after all this time to have people still discovering the film and saying good things about it. It's, uh, it certainly encourages me to try to get a new project off the ground and get going with it. Yeah. Like I said, I, I enjoyed it. It, um, like I said, it just had stuff in it that I loved, you mm -hmm. know, from, you know, movies that I watched growing up. Um, right. and is, you know, had, and it, it was, um, and I think it was more, I think I was more surprised by how much I loved it considering it was just, a you know, Amazon, you know, recommendation. Um, <laughs> and I, like, I, like, I kind of wish I would have seen it, you know, years ago or, um, I noticed when I went to your website, the um, you had some of your DVDs on sale, but they were through eBay. So is that, is that how you're selling the DVDs, is only well, through eBay? We shifted. Uh, I mean, eBay sales and Amazon sales. for uh, the, the Demon Resurrection DVD is available through Amazon, but it's available through us through Amazon. Amazon never stopped it. Uh, as I say, when we approached them, they said, we don't deal with individual filmmakers. you got to go through somebody else. So we said, okay, well, we'll just create a seller account on Amazon and sell it that way. But the problem there is that they take such an enormous, you know, portion of the of the revenue mm -hmm. that it actually is better to sell it on eBay. It's really basically the same thing. The DVD is the same, and uh, we we get it to people in the same period of time. So we started recommending the eBay. Uh, uh, posting rather than the Amazon posting of the, of the DVD. But the DVD as it exists now is a standard definition. It's the old cut. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess people maybe might want to pick it up uh, to have it as a, a relic of a, <laughs> a, a long gone time, a standard definition, full screen, uh, shot on video horror movie, shot on uh, standard definition video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, that's like something that's the the DVD is definitely something I'm I'm definitely going to pick. I'm going to pick one up. Well, if you, <laughs> uh, I, given how kind you've been, I'll I'll, I'll make sure that Frank sends you a, a freebie. Oh, okay. You, you, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, you, you deserve it for all the uh, all the kind words you, you've uh, you've given the film. So, yeah, uh, I appreciate that, um, and I appreciate you coming on here and uh, you know talking with me. I was. Uh, just you know, I was watched the watch the movie. And I was like, let me reach out to this guy and see if he wants to be on here, and he did. So like, again, I thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a great pleasure, and, and uh, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting experience to be talking about something I made 15 years ago. But, right. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm happy to see that the film still has some life in it, and that people are still enjoying it. So thank you for asking me on. Oh yeah, no problem. I, like I said, I enjoyed the movie, and hopefully, I can have you back on. Uh, for anything else you have coming out. Yeah, well, as soon as I get my uh, new version of Sleepless Nights finished, I'll send along a screen to you, and maybe we can chat about that. We, I definitely look forward to that. And again, thank you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Take care. All right. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. The unburied dead are coming back to life, seeking human victims. <laughs>